welcome you to our ninth Hall of Fame induction. And uh, as usual, we have a full house and we have a great group of inductees today. And we would like to get through this program as quickly as possible so with, and still honor everybody uh, sufficiently. So please cooperate with that if, if you can. And uh, as soon as we get the inductees back to their seats, I will give you a little heads up on how the program is going to run. Right now, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our 2017 class, Milford High School Hall of Fame. I'm Nick Sakili. Uh, I'll serve as a master of ceremonies today and I'm also the uh, general chairman of the Hall of Fame committee. Uh, I'd just like to give you a brief background. Um, we have a 15 member voting committee for the Hall of Fame. Included in that is an old timers committee. Uh, right now, the old timers committee considers uh, inductees prior to 1965, um, classes of 1965 at Milford High School. And they present us with two names that are automatically inducted each, uh, um, every two years. We are now at an uh, every two year cycle because it is quite an undertaking to get everybody uh, recognized uh, and get all the material together. Um, and the rest of the committee then votes on any presentations that they have and we keep everybody on file. Uh, that's why some of you may have been uh, nominated a few cycles ago and uh, just getting recognized now. We always have uh, quite a few people to uh, go through. The committee gets together and then votes. And uh, if there's a three-quarter vote of the committee, um, those people get inducted. And at the same time, we also like to uh, include um, some championship teams, and, as, and we have three today that we'll be inducting. Um, serves as a good way to get everybody back together and reminisce about the good old days and uh, the good times and the championships that they won for Milford High School. Uh, but we do need your help in the back of the program booklets. Please take, some, take them home with you. There is a uh, uh, little explanation about what the Hall of Fame is all about. There's also a nomination form in there, and we welcome nominations. Uh, you can just send them to me. I believe my address is on there now. Uh, we used to get them up to high school when I was working, but uh, they tend to get lost in the mail now up there when, when my name is still on them. So it's at my home address they can be sent to. Uh, and please send us as much information because, again, you know, 1965 doesn't seem like that long ago, but uh, some of the members on the committee don't really know some of the athletes. So the more information that you can provide us, the easier it is for us to make a selection. Um, you know, I think we, we, pretty, we do a pretty good job. And again, everybody can't be recognized that's nominated each year, but we do keep your nominations on file. It's on a ballot. And each year, the ones that are elected come off and the new ones go on. So uh, it's an ongoing process. So without further ado, I'd like to, at this time, recognize our current Milford High School Athletic Director that many of you may not know. Uh, Mr. Peter Boucher, and he will say a few words uh, before we get the program going. Thank you, Coach Zakili. Uh, before I get started today, I do want to read something for our current principal, Josh Otland. Uh, we had to divide and conquer today, and I'll explain a little bit from his words if you would uh, indulge me for a moment. And this is from Principal Otland. I'm very sorry not to be with you this afternoon to celebrate the achievements of our outstanding Milford High School alumni. While I had been looking forward to this event, our cheer team won a spot in the state championships today and Peter and I decided to divide and conquer. So while midday cocktails with all of you would have been very nice, I am up in Worcester supporting our student athletes as they compete for a state championship. 
Many of you know how very special it is to compete at this level, and I hope you'll understand why I'm in Worcester and not with you. I do want to thank all of you for coming together for this great event, and I especially want to thank Mr. Nick Sakili for his leadership on this important project. The Hall of Fame plays an important role in our school community by providing generations of student athletes with a daily reminder that they are a part of a tradition of excellence. The stories and images in the Hall of Fame are an inspiration to our students and a testament to what we can achieve when we fully commit ourselves to be the very best. To our inductees, you will now be part of the, that inspiration and rightfully so. Many thousands of student athletes have competed as Scarlet Hawks, but you are among the very best to have ever represented our school. Congratulations on this well-deserved honor and thank you for setting the bar so high for our current and future generations of student athletes. So that is from our principal. Um, before we get started, I would like to first and foremost, uh, myself, and as Josh did a really great job, he actually took a lot of things that I was going to say today and everyone has reminded me to be really, really succinct and be really, really short, which I will try to do. Uh, but before we get started, I do want to uh, send a very large thank you to Nick Sakili and the Hall of Fame Committee. And before we get moving, I'd like the Hall of Fame Committee to stand up, please, those folks that have worked so hard with Nick. Just for a quick round of applause, everybody here working hard. It, it's an honor to be the Milford High School Athletic Director. I understand what the tradition and excellence is all about, and I've been able to meet with this committee over the past four years, and the work and the energy and the effort and just the knowledge that they bring, uh, dating all the way back to Milford High School opening up is impressive, and, and I'm in awe that these folks remember as much as they do, and it's just, it's fun. It's, it, it's, it's enjoyable for me to be a part of that. Uh, to today's inductees, former inductees, family, friends, fans, and to anybody in the room who suited up for Scarlet Hawk Nation, uh, just a heartfelt thank you. Um, you've set the bar exceptionally high for our 21st century student athletes, and for that we are forever grateful. Your blood, sweat, tears, and countless hours of practice and competing, in my opinion, have blazed a trail that we are encouraging and expecting our current student athletes and Scarlet Hawks to follow, so we appreciate Everything anybody has done that has suited up and, and worn the red and white, we, we take that very seriously. Uh, quick state of the union, where we are right now. Uh, many of you probably know that we're in a new league. This is our sixth or seventh league. It's my fourth league. I grew up in this league. I competed in this league. I coached in, in this league. Um, our current varsity athletic programs sit at 27 varsity teams. We're somewhere around 58, 59 sub-varsity when you take the JV boys and girls, freshmen, etc. And we also have three unified teams, which really makes 30 varsity teams total. We're quickly acclimating to the depth of the Hockamock League, where the vast majority of our teams are competing for playoff berths and Hockamock Divisional Championships. I would encourage you all to swing by the Crystal Room uh, this Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. That's a big alumni event for the uh, football team, but it's, from my understanding and the times that I've been there, it's just alumni in general. So we'd love to see you. And the Thanksgiving Day game kicks off at 10.15 at home this year. Uh, that's another great alumni event. We'd love to see everybody there as well. Anytime I get the microphone, I do like to share a perspective that I think is unique to me. Because my going joke is, I was born in Milford, but it took me 40 years to truly get back into Milford. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed and I feel very lucky to have been chosen four years ago, ago to be the next athletic director. But I spent uh, 22 years of my teaching, coaching, principal, and AD career in two other high schools, okay? Both of them in the Hockamock League, and I do want to share with you, and I mean this sincerely, it, it might sound a little funny tongue-in-cheek, but Milford is a very special place. Uh, it absolutely is, and, and I say this because most communities claim to support athletics. They talk about people power, they talk about finances, but when the rubber meets the road and somebody's got to sign the check or people have to show up, at an event with their people power, sometimes it falls short. I can tell you in the time, and actually most likely, most of the time it does fall short in other communities. Um, but in my time here, I can tell you in the four years that I've been here, no matter what the call has been, no matter what we needed, whether it was people power to get kids to this national track and field meet, or to, to, we need new uniforms for this team, or we need a new facility, you know, talk about facilities and, and how the MIA knocks on our door to come to Milford because of, of, of what we have to offer the entire state. Um, 
Milford answers the call, whether it's financially or people power. And that's not, you know, you folks that are, that are Milfordians that have always come to Milford, you might not be aware that the surrounding communities don't necessarily have that. So for me, as the athletic director, uh, it's just an unbelievable blessing to be able to have that. And I thank everybody in the room and anybody you know uh, that you grew up with that, or that you know in the Milford community that, that supports what we do because it's incredibly important. Most of you know that a lot of life lessons truly are learned in the practices, in the trenches, in the competitions, in the classroom as well. As a former principal and teacher, that's absolutely important. But I can tell you for myself, I learned more life lessons by coaching and competing and, and teaching the lessons that we have on the, on the uh, athletic arenas. And um, to sum it up, I'll try to keep it as short as I can, Coach. Um, it's, I'm humbled and honored to be here with you today, to spend the afternoon with just the greatness that is in this room. I was joking with, the, with a couple of people that I knew, and you look around. H have you ever seen a, a bigger or better athletic looking type of people. You look at everybody in the room and 99% of you look like athletes, they look like they're ready to compete. And most of us, if you said, hey, ring the bell, sound the whistle, you know, kick off, we're ready to go. And I think it's just awesome to hang out with you folks for the after afternoon. You are the 1%, you are the greatest of Milford, the 1% best of Milford, you're the best of the best. And I just thank you for allowing me to do what I do in town and. Uh, enjoy the afternoon. Enjoy the celebrations you've earned. It. With no further ado, we're going to start our presentation today um, with uh, Mr. Frank Berry. And one of the good things about my one of the things I enjoy about doing this is, especially with the old timers, uh, you know, you know the names. I remember walking into Lynch Auditorium and seeing. Mr. Berry's picture on the outside wall of Lynch Auditorium when I was in high school, um, but you never know what that person did. And honestly, I knew he was an administrator. I never really knew, um, you know, he was a coach and uh, a very important person um, as far as Milford High School athletics go. So without further ado, Mr. Frank Berry will be the first inductee. Frank C. Berry, coach and administrator, 1915 to 1946. Frank C. Berry filled many roles during his illustrious career with Milford Public Schools, a high school teacher, a coach, faculty manager of students, athletic director, principal of Milford High School, and superintendent of schools. Throughout his tenure, he was considered a strong advocate and benefactor for the welfare of his students, not only intellectually, but also physically and socially. Mr. Berry strongly believed that athletics played an important part in the overall development of young men. Athletics for young women was unheard of at the time. He assumed the position of athletic director and baseball coach in the spring of 1915 and promptly led the team to the Midland League pennant with an overall record of 16-5. and In the fall of 1916, he established the first cross-country program. With the reinstatement of basketball as a competitive sport at MHS in December 1916, Mr. Berry added that sport to his coaching portfolio, which now also included football. He continued to coach all three sports through 1924, although his service was briefly interrupted by a stint in the U.S. Navy in 1918. It's been said that the foundations for all three sports at the interscholastic level at Milford High were set by Coach Berry. Mr. Berry's duties as an administrator may have shortened his high school career, but Baseball remained in his blood. He coached Milford in the Blackstone Valley League during the summer in the late 1920s. The true father of Milford Legion baseball, he established the first Sergeant John W. Powers post team in 1929, finishing as a runner-up in the state championship that season. He followed that up with back-to-back -back state titles in 1930 and 1931 before relinquishing his coaching duties in 1935. Mr. Berry served as principal at Milford High from 1932 until 1941. During that time, he initiated a full program of senior week activities and in 1935, the MHS Students Association, today's Student Council, both of which are still important parts of the student life at Milford High. In 1941, he was appointed superintendent of schools, a post he held until his untimely death in 1946. I'd like to uh, call Coach Berry's granddaughter, uh, Barbara Berry Ogier, up to uh, uh, accept the plaque.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What a wonderful uh, video that was. On behalf of Frank C. Berry and his family, I'd like to thank the Milford High School Athletic Hall of Fame um, Selection Committee for this prestigious recognition and wonderful ceremony. Seventy years after David Davrin wrote the memoriam that appeared in the class of 1947 Oak, Lily, and Ivy yearbook, his niece Evelyn Bontempo and her son Michael contacted me to discuss nominating Frank C. Berry to the Milford High School Hall of Fame. Not knowing much about my grandfather's influence on Milford High School athletic programs, I reached out to my uncle Frank, who was able to provide a timeline and other helpful information. Frank C. Berry was first and foremost a family man who adored his wife Helen and three children, Frank D., Betty Ann, and Joseph Paul. Representing the family today, we have present Frank D's granddaughter, Adrian Danis, Betty Ann's children, Jeffrey Coniaris and his daughter, Catherine, Thomas Coniaris and his wife, Alla, Paul's children, Joseph Berry, myself and my husband, Richard Oja, and our daughters, Dana and Pauline. Frank's eldest son resides in California. He was unable to join us today, but asked me to share his thoughts. He sent an email, and, in his, and these are his words. Once a Milfordian, always a Milfordian. Silicon Valley for 60 years has been home, but Milford has always been near and dear to my heart. So I was really thrilled to, live, to learn of Dad's election to the Milford High School Athletic Hall of Fame. That's a big deal. Dad was a wonderful father, great family man, and my childhood in Milford was idyllic. My memories are so positive. Milford was a great place to be reared. His vocation was education, and he rose from math and science teacher to become superintendent of schools. Art Kenny, certainly one of Milford's outstanding athletes and eventually a superintendent himself in Keene, New Hampshire, told me years ago, when your dad became principal, Milford High School, at Milford High School, we lost our best teacher. His advocation was baseball, and his coaching and managerial skills were outstanding. His successes at Milford High brought statewide recognition and launched the start of, the Milford, of Milford as the great baseball town. His 1924 team especially had an enviable record beaten several highly rated Boston teams. Later, Dad coached the Milford Town League and the famous Blackstone Valley Summer League. In 1929, he started Legion Baseball in coaching the team to two state championships. He had an enviable record. His achievement in education and baseball had a commonality. He had the know-how, the know-how, excuse me, plus an uncanny ability to handle both students and athletes, a real winning combo. I'm very proud of my dad. Thank you to all. Frank Berry, Milford High School, class of 1937. Frank was educated in Worcester Public Schools, graduated from Holy Cross in 1913, and received his Masters of Art at Clark University in 1914. He was an athlete. During his school years, he played baseball until a so soldier, so shoulder injury prevented him from continuing. Frank worked for 32 years from November 1914 through December 1946 in the Milford Public School System. During this time, he served as teacher, athletic director, coach, schoolmaster, principal, and superintendent of schools. As a teacher and athletic director in the Milford Public Schools, Frank was a proponent of physical education for every student. He introduced intramural sports such as cross country and basketball. In addition, he coached the Milford High School varsity baseball and football teams. During the time Frank coached, he faced many challenges, including the Spanish influenza, World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. Young men and women were often called upon to help their family. 
Through it all, Frank was known for his high educational standards and excellent coaching skills, which earned him the respect of students and staff. The class of 1932 dedicated their yearbook, stating, Frank C. Berry, the inspiration of our achievements, the friend and champion of our high school years. Frank remained Milford High School coach until 1924 due to overcrowded at the Milford High School um, and they implemented the platoon system, which required morning and afternoon sessions. His passion for baseball continued. He coached in the Blackstone Valley Summer League during the 1920s until the spring of 28, as he was driving past Wistas Lake Park, currently known as Tibbon Field, he stopped to watch a baseball game. This is when he learned of Junior Legion Baseball. He was so impressed that he turned, returned to Powers Post 59 and convinced officials to add Legion Baseball to their program. <coughs> In 1929, Milford fielded its first Legion baseball team with Frank Berry as head coach. The team was runner-up for their first year, won the states in 1930 and 31, and runner-up in 32 and 33. Frank coached the team until 35 when he stepped down and was replaced by former student and athlete Chris Pep Marcone. Thirteen athletes coached by Frank Berry are members of the Milford Athletic Hall of Fame. They include Lou Calabrese, class of 18, Frederick Ted Steves, class of 23, Jay Francis, Fitta Cahill, class of 24, Thomas Davern, class of 25, Alfred Red, Red Alzarini, class of 26, George E. Pine, class of 26, Chris Pep Marcon, class of 29, Henry Tate Bodio, class of 33, Charles J. Bacato, class of 33, Ernest A. Richards, class of 33, Henry Hank Camoli, class of 34, Alfred Cook, class of 34, and I. Kenny, class of 34. None of the family present today had the opportunity to meet Frank Berry, but as a result of the Milford Hall of Fame Award, we have a greater understanding of Frank's impact on Milford athletics and feel a closer bond to our grandfather. We truly are honored by this recognition and want to express our heartfelt thanks. Respectfully, Barbara Oja, class of 75. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, next posthumous induction is Jeffrey D. Charrington, class of 1977. Jeffrey D. Charrington, class of 1976. Jeffrey D. Charrington arrived at Milford High School as a junior in the fall of 1974 after attending Platteville High School in Wisconsin. He immediately immersed himself in the athletic program at MHS, joining the cross-country team on which he competed during his junior and senior years. The new Milford High School, complete with a spectacular aquatics facility, it opened in the fall of 1973, and swimming was offered as a varsity sport for the first time in 74. Jeff and his brothers, Brett and Kent, who'd swum competitively for numerous years at both the club and high school level in their previous hometown, quickly became mainstays on the team. Jeff could be counted on to score points in just about any event, but he excelled in both the butterfly and the breaststroke. He set school records in the 100-yard fly, the 50 freestyle, 400-yard freestyle relay, and the 200 individual medley, a record he held for over 20 years. During his senior year, he was a finalist at both the MIAA state championships and the New England regional championships. Jeff went on to compete in swimming for four years at the University of New Hampshire, captaining the swim team his junior and senior years. He qualified and swam the New England Intercollegiate Swimming Championships each year, finishing his senior season as a finalist in the 200 and 400 individual medley and the 800 freestyle relay while setting school records in each event. In 2002, Jeff competed in the World Corporate Games in Lille, France, and came away with three medals, a gold in the 200 IM, a silver in both the 50 and 100 butterfly, one of only two Americans to take home medals. Jeff passed away in 2007 at the age of 49.
I'd like to invite uh, Jeff's sister, Jill D'Antonio, up to say a few words. On behalf of the entire Charrington family, I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame Committee for my brother's nomination. Jeff began swimming as a toddler. He was on his first swim team when he was five. While living in Wisconsin, my dad transferred the family to Boston. When my parents came to find houses, they looked for a high school that had a swimming pool. In April of 1974, they were fortunate that the new Milford High School had opened eight months earlier in the fall of 1973. Mark Spitz had just recently won seven gold medals in the Olympics, and Milford wanted to get in on the sport of the future. This was a tough job with the other fall sport, football, and some guy named Howie Long. That April, when we moved to Milford, Jeff was a sophomore in high school. Jeff swam in his junior and senior year. He graduated from high school holding three individual school records, which he held for over 20 years. Jeff and the swim team saw success with his two teammates, Stephen Ostapower, Bill Vinolini, Mark Chaplin, Terry Moran, just to name a few, and of course, his two brothers, Brett and Kent. Swimming in the Milfords during the 70s was a family affair. Families had several children, all swimming on the town teams. In the summer, we swam at the Milford Town Pool and the Milford State Pool. And in the winter, Whitensville Community Center for the Blue Dolphins. The community center opened early so we could swim before school. Yep, that meant being in Whitensville for 5 a.m. Swimming in Milford, you became part of a special group of supportive and fun families. Jeff participated in four different sports during his time at Milford High. He had the unique experience of having four different coaches in those two short years in Milford, to include Peter Filosa, Richard Pulse, Dennis Breen, and James McCallum. He took the experiences and lessons learned from each when he co coached the Holliston swim team in college and in life. I knew if Jeff were here to accept this award, he would be humbled to be receiving such an award. When he was asked back to Milford to recognize his accolades, as well as joining the achievements of Paul DeVita, who would break some of Jeff's records, he was so happy to share in stories and triumphs of Milford High School, as well inspire the youth in swimming and in life. I know my brother would like to thank his parents for everything they had done in his swimming and athletic career. They never missed a game, either away or home. Even when he went to UNH, they traveled to nearly every meet. No one was more proud of Jeff than our mother. She would encourage and support him in any way she could, whether traveling for meets, tracking swim times, or baking cookies so the team had some treats. She was there for my brother. He appreciated his parents' and siblings' supports, and yes, my sister Colette and I were dragged to every single meet. Growing up as the younger sisters to Jeff and my other two swing and diving brothers, we had a reputation. Oh, you're a Charrington? You mean a swimming Charrington? We would roll our eyes and say yes, but of course we loved every minute of Walming in our brother's notoriety. Jeff inspired many with his excitement, adventure, and zest for life. His adventures began at Milford High School, which may have gotten him into a little trouble from time to time. Whether he was skiing with ski club, at math events, traveling with the French club, or playing sports, Jeff was laughing and having fun. These memories of Milford High School followed him through his life. My brother Jeff lived his life with a sense of the importance of family, education, laughter, adventure, excitement, and of course, swimming in sports. We are all honored that he has been chosen to be a member of the Milford High School Athletic Hall of Fame. Thank you, Jill. Um, Charringtons, for those of you that were around at the time, all five uh, of the children were great contributors to Milford High School sports, and we may be hearing from them again in the future. And next up on our agenda, uh, the 1956, uh, class of 57, football team. 1956 football team.
As soon as the 1955 football season had ended, Milford Daily News sports editor Stanley Jones wrote, Milford High School looms as a serious contender for the Midland League Championship next fall. It was also written that head coach John Calagione admitted the prospects for next season are as bright now as at any time since I stepped to the helm in 1953. Coach Calagione based his optimism on the fact that the team would be filled with a lot of experienced regulars returning for next year. Co-captains Dick Rizzoli and Tony Ferranti led a strong group of athletes, among them Charlie D'Antonio, Bento Do Corral, Dennis Tessasini, Bob Marseglia, Lenny Oliveri, George Pine, John DiGregorio, Don Milani, and several others who figured to play a significant role with the team. Both Jones and Caligioni were not to be disappointed in their optimism. The team had a memorable season, finishing 7-1, the lone loss coming in a hard-fought game by a score of 19-13 against undefeated Marlboro, a game that ultimately determined the Midland League championship. Highlights of the season included beating Clinton for the first time in 13 years, 12 to nothing. That was the second game of the year. Beating Bartlett High of Webster, a team that had won 12 straight games by a score of 28 to 6. And fielding a defensive team that allowed only 33 points in eight games, earning three shutouts along the way. No other team in the Midland League came close to that effort. Co-captain Tony Ferranti was also named to the Midland League All-Star team. It was written in the Milford Daily News that finishing second in the league to a team that beat them by only six points, quote, made it a season with the best one lost record in the post-war era and possibly the best in local history to that point. The team was also ranked fourth in all of central Massachusetts by the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. Representing the 1956 uh, football team, uh, Lenny Oliveri, and Lenny promised that he would uh, only speak as long as he played, which shouldn't be too long. <laughs> Actually, members of the team, please come up, and Lenny can also introduce those that are here. Members of the team that are here, please come up. That way you can drag them down. To the Actually, I'm not going to repeat what was said. They stole the thunder. So I'll just kind of introduce the players that are here and, and uh, go over the list of guys that were on the team. That's Henry Consigli, uh, John DiGregorio, Bento Du Corral. We're all part of the team, and I'd just like to go over... Uh, some of the others. I'm representing Dick Rizzoli, who could not be here due to another commitment. Other members of the team were Joe Brenner, Elma Mograss, who snuck out, Dennis Tessasini, Lou Volpe, Bob Marsalia, Ronnie Speroni, C. John, Mike Morgan, George Pine, Walter Nero, Charlie D'Antonio, John Balanca, Anthony Lamenti, Gino Cordani, uh, Aldo Chakey, Henry's here, Joe Morrow, Ray Andriotti, Ron Martin, Tom Glennon, John Senecandro, Herb Fernandes, Dave Davin, and Rob LaRama. Those were the members of the team. Uh, I'm not going to read this because you just heard it, so I'm not going to go over it again. But what I'd like to do is just take a moment to uh, have a little moment for the deceased members of the team that have uh, passed away. And those would be uh, our co-captain, one of them was Tony Ferranti. Lou Volpe, George Pine, Ron Speroni, Walter Nero, uh, Joe Brenner, and Mitchell Lynch. Those are the deceased members. So once again, we'd like to thank the committee for nominating us and, and giving us this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda, Charles J. Bracado III, class of 1991. Charles J. Bracado III, class of 1991. C.J. Bracado was a gifted athlete who compiled some impressive statistics when he starred in football and baseball at Milford High School and later in football at Princeton University. 
The numbers in the long list of all-star honors stand out, but what set him above his peers was his ability to compete with great intensity and to reach his maximum potential both on the field and in the classroom. A three-year varsity letter winner on the football field, C.J. played on both sides of the ball during his junior and senior years at the two most physical positions, fullback and linebacker. He co-captained the 1990 team to the Midland League Championship while also leading the team in tackling, rushing yards, and touchdowns. Highlights of his career included a 100-yard, two-touchdown effort in an opening game last-second win against Natick in 1989 and a 180-yard, two-score performance against perennial power Dartmouth in 1990. A two-time Midwatch League and Milford Daily News All-Star, he was the team MVP as well as the South County All-Star Game defensive MVP as a senior. On the baseball diamond, C.J. was a three-year starter as a catcher. And as good as he was defensively, he may have been an even better hitter. As a junior in 1990, batting cleanup, he hit 397 and led the team in extra base hits and RBIs on the way to a record of 25-0 and the Division I state championship against New Bedford. He followed that up with a better senior year, hitting 417, again leading the team in extra base hits and RBIs, and co-captain the Scarlet Hawks to the second straight state championship appearance where they were defeated by Andover. A two-time Midwatch League and Milford Daily News All-Star, he was also chosen to the Worcester Telegram Super Team both in 1989 and 1990. C.J. finished his athletic career as a three-year letter winner and two-year starter at fullback on Princeton teams that finished 8-2, 8-2, and 7-3, and 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 winning an Ivy League championship in 1992. As the leading scorer on the 1994 team, he was selected to the Ivy League All-Star team. He had the distinction of carrying the ball 125 times without a fumble during his entire career. C.J. Thanks a lot. Um, first off, just like to offer some congratulations to uh, my fellow honorees. Uh, it's a pretty amazing roster. Um, Robbie Lanzetta, to name a couple, Robbie Lanzetta was, was my idol growing up. Uh, I wore number 45, that was his number, and uh, played the same position. So, uh, you know, great to be up here, you know, along with him. Uh, my classmate, Kevin Fair, you know, he was really the best athlete in the class. And so, if, uh, if I'm here, he's gotta be here. So, uh, you know, congratulations to you guys. It's an honor to be, be up here with you. Uh, thanks to the committee. Um, just to, you know, for me, you know, I think uh, as I sort of sum up my career and my life for that matter, I really sort of think about, you know, all the people that, you know, that, that supported me, you know, all the people that, you know, that sort of got me to, to where I ended up. Um, and, and for that, I'm deeply thankful. And, you know, those are the folks I'd like to, you know, sort of recognize uh, today. You know, first up, uh, the coaches, uh, you know, at Milford High, I had three Hall of Famers. Uh, first up, uh, in baseball, uh, Charlie Stand, uh, the guy was just, just a winner. Uh, he really knew just what to say to get under your skin to get the best out of you. And, and he really, you know, had some, we had some great, my senior, my senior team wasn't a great team, but we ended up in the state championship and that was really, you know, all on Charlie. Uh, the late uh, Dennis Breen, just an unbelievable competitor. Uh, just had a passion for the game of football and, and, and again, I think, you know, got a lot more out of, you know, his players uh, uh, than, than, than anyone else could have. Uh, and then lastly, uh, John Dagnes, uh, who's here today. Just a master motivator. Um, I never feared anyone as much as Daga. But I always knew that, you know, he loved us, you know, he loved his players. Uh, in college, uh, I had a great position coach, a guy named uh, Steve DiGregorio. He would have fit in perfectly uh, in Milford. Another Italian guy. Uh, he was tough. You know, he walked around on two broken knees, and I would literally, you know, run, run through a wall for him. And, and even today, uh, we have a great relationship. Uh, next up, uh, I'd just like to thank my my friends and my and my teammates, uh, uh, Scott Kernan, uh, Paul Pellegrini. Matt and Sigley, Tommy Burns, all here. Uh, Jeff Capitos is not here. It was a pleasure to go to battle with, with you guys. Uh, you know, every week and every other day in baseball. Uh, you know, those are, those are the memories that I that I think about. You know, when I think about my career. Um, and then, you know, probably most importantly, you know, to uh, my family. Um, and uh, you know, if we start with my my grandpa Babe, who many of you probably know. Uh, you know, he sort of you know instilled in me the. 
uh, don't worry what, what other people think about you. Um, you know, do your own thing. And uh, certainly, he beats, you know, dance, uh, marched to the beat of his own drummer. Great guy. Uh, Grammarie, I learned uh, perseverance, hard work, service to others. Um, my late Grandma Connie, just, just the love of knowledge and learning and culture and family and, and probably most importantly, uh, a food. Uh, <laughs> my Grandpa Charlie, uh, another Hall of Famer, uh, just, just honored to be you know, in there with this legend. I mean, war hero, educator, coach, uh, elite athlete, just a great inspiration to me. And just, you know, soft-spoken but poignant, you know, when, when he spoke. Um, my Aunt Marilyn, who's here, um, literally gave me my name. Uh, you know, she created CJ. Um, there were two Charlies walking around, so they needed a way to differentiate me, and that was sort of, uh, she, she did that for me at Perth. Uh, my Uncle Joe, uh, who's also here, just the love of, of music and history, um, love of knowledge. Um, my Uncle John, uh, another great coach uh, in his own right. Uh, really, you know, sort of gave me the love, love for football um, and, you know, really mastering the psychology of the game. And, and, you know, I sort of took that with me, you know, uh, into college, into my professional career. Uh, my sister Lisa uh, Burns, who's here, um, you know, she was just dragged to countless games uh, and never complained in rain and snow and, and, you know, has always showed me unconditional love and support. Um, my mom. Uh, you know, believe it or not, my, my mom is really where my toughness comes from. Uh, you know, talk about that tough guy up there. This is one tough lady. Uh, loving, uh, but tough uh, as well. And then, you know, my dad. Uh, you know, my dad, who, who many of you know, you know, committed himself to me uh, in, in, in an amazing way. You know, through countless hours of BP to me. You know, taught me the game of life through sports. And uh, really, you know, taught me to be a man and a father. Um, so... I love you all. I thank you. Uh, this is our honor. Uh, and, and then just one last thing to my kids, uh, Georgia, Grace, Gemma, who are all here. I want to thank you for my most cherished gift, uh, making me a dad. I think I'm probably proud of the, of the most. So uh, thank you. Um, it's an honor and I um, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> that was Mike's idea. You have to give Mike credit for that. Okay, next up, another Milford legend uh, in the beginning of the 1960s, late 50s, 1960, Nick DeLegge, class of 1960. Nicholas DeLegge, class of 1960. Nicholas DeLegge was never one to shy away from contact. That trait and a work ethic second to none led him to a successful two-sport career at Milford High School. Nick was a two-way starter for Coach John Caligioni on the gridiron. He was like a battering ram from his fullback position, putting his head down and steam rolling straight through the hole created by his lineman. Not too many opponents were anxious to step in front of him to slow him down. During his senior year, he led the team in rushing touchdowns, earning himself a spot on the Midland League All-Star team. A ferocious tackler, he was a hard-hitting linebacker on defense and led the team in tackles, also served as the team's place kicker. It was on the baseball diamond, however, that Nick really excelled. From Little League to Babe Ruth, high school to American Legion, he was always among the leading hitters throughout his career. As a senior, he led Milford High School with a 379 batting average and was also among the top RBI men. Not to be overlooked was Nick's defense. He was an exceptional fielding first baseman who played a big part in the success of his teams. His all-around ability was instrumental for the 1959 Powers Post American Legion baseball squad, which not only won the state championship that year, but also earned a trip to the American Legion National Championships by winning the Northeast Regionals, which were played in Keene, New Hampshire. Thousands of Milford fans traveled to cheer the team on through the tournament, causing American Legion officials to declare Milford the best baseball town in America. Nick's leadership and performance was also instrumental in Milford High School winning the Massachusetts Class B State Championship over Somerville at the end of his senior year in 1960. I'd like to invite Nick DeLegge up to say a few words. I 
I would like to thank the uh, Milford High um, Hall of Fame Committee and all of you for coming here today, and especially, especially my family and all the rest of you. And a special thanks to Mike Berta for helping out, uh, getting me started on this uh, great day. Um, I'd like to say that in Milford, like we just talked about here, Milford High baseball team, we played every day of the summer. We played in the morning at baseball, we went swimming in the afternoon. We went on our bikes and went up to Town Park and played Little League baseball. And in the fall we played football, in the winter we played ice hockey on Milford Pond. And no matter what game we were playing, we always played it to the hardest part we could play. But I think with all our hearts, and we showed it by the teams that we had. Now, in 1956, I was a freshman in Milford High, and I have the privilege to have Coach Consoletti as my uh, freshman coach in football, Coach Calagione as my varsity coach in football, and Coach Espinette for my varsity baseball coach, and Pat Marcone in the later years that I had uh, played with the Milford Legion. There's not much you can talk about Pat Marcone, his record speaks for itself. Charlie Espinette, Coach Charlie Espinette, was a teacher and a, a, a coach. He taught us fundamentals of baseball. Taught us how to hit, he taught us how to uh, bunt, he taught us how to run bases, but most of all, he taught us sportsmanship. He taught us how to win with dignity, how to lose with dignity, and after every game, we went up to Town Park, my team and myself, and we practiced. We practiced our best parts and we practiced the bonus and everything else we made. But we played hard every day. And he showed us loyalty, he showed us dignity, he showed us respect. And we in turn showed it back to ourselves as a team, our high school, and our coaches. And when when we get going as far as our pride that he showed us, when we came on the field, at Fino Field or in, a, in another town that we played in, we showed our pride by the way we dressed. We came out with clean uniforms all the time, thanks to our mothers, of course, the clean <laughs> uniform. We came out with hats on straight, our, our shirts tucked in, our pants and our stocks pulled up, and Coach Espinette would expect nothing less. And let's not forget our Milford fans. I don't care if it was in the 1930s when they were starting this or into the 1950s, 60s or whatever, Milford always had the best fans. They were there for us at every game, they cheered us on at every game, and they were the best. About 10 years ago, my wife and I were in a grocery store in Milford, and a man and his wife came up, an elderly couple of course, and they said, are you Nick DeLegge that played first base for Milford High and the Milford Legion? I said, yes I am. And he said to me, he said, we are your biggest fans. We followed your teams all over, no matter where we, you played, and we never missed a game. Do you remember this game and that game and this play and that play? And he even comes out and said, did you remember that three-run home run you made in New Bedford? I mean, this brought memories back to me, like, this is 40 years after all this happened. It brought memories back to me that when I got back out to my car, I thanked him for being the best uh, fans that we have in Milford, but when I get back out to my car with my wife and I said to her, I said, can you imagine after 40 years somebody remembers my name, remembers the positions, remembers our team, what we did, how we played, where we played, there's nothing better than Milford fans. And about four to five years ago, my wife and I came down from Alaska where we now live and we, uh, we found out that Charlie Espinette, we come down here to uh, visit our family, and then we found out that Charlie Espinette was at the Milford Geriatrics Nursing Home. So we went up to pay him a visit. And as soon as we, upon entering his room, he looked up at us, knew our names right away, called out Nick and Joy, and started asking questions. So I explained to him that we've been married for up to almost 50 years, going on 50 years. We have three great children, six wonderful grandchildren, four in college, two in elementary schools, and we've been very lucky and blessed to travel all over the world, uh, seeking adventure and hunting and fishing wherever we go. I, he, he just looked at me and he, he had questions, so I waited. 
And he said to me, he says, Nick, you always did love your hunting and fishing. And I again stepped back and I said, after 50 years and all the people he taught in school, all the players he coached, he could remember that Nick DeLegge, one player, actually loved his hunting and fishing. It just goes to speak just amounts of, 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 of how great our teachers and our coaches were in that day. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate you all for coming and sharing this day with all the other inductees and myself. And God bless all of you, and God bless the American, the United States of America for giving us the privilege and the freedom to, to, to go after our freedoms. Thank you very much. Before I call our next inductee, I'd just like to uh, recognize my son Christopher for helping put together the video presentation and also for the voiceover and other Milford High School alumni, alumnus who you may recognize his voice, Chris Villani, who is on ESPN Radio and WEEI. He does that for us every year. So thanks to those two. Next up, uh, Kevin Fair, class of 1991. Kevin Fair, class of 1991. Kevin Fair is widely considered one of the finest multi-sport athletes to ever graduate from Milford High School. Although he excelled in both soccer and basketball, he also played varsity tennis as a freshman where he earned Rookie of the Year honors, JV baseball as a sophomore, and varsity golf, where as a senior he played in the number one position, qualified for both the league and district individual championships, and was named team MVP. On the soccer pitch, Kevin was a four-year starter at midfield and a three-year captain, the only MHS athlete ever to hold that distinction. He earned Rookie of the Year honors as a freshman on the 1987 Midland League Championship team. He was named Team MVP in each of the next three seasons, another singular distinction, earning numerous all-star selections along the way. He was chosen by opposing coaches to the All-Central Mass First Team in 1988, 89, and 90, scoring over 50 goals and adding 60 assists during his four-year career records that still stand to this day. Kevin was just as outstanding, if not more so, on the basketball court. A three-year varsity starter, he could play anywhere on the court and usually matched up defensively with the opponent's top scorer. As a captain and the only returning starter his senior year, Kevin scored 32 points and grabbed 18 rebounds against Algonquin, a game that clinched the 1991 Midwatch League Championship. He had a triple-double with 22 points, 15 rebounds, and 10 steals in the Clark Tournament semifinals against Westboro and followed that up with 35 points and 20 rebounds in a losing effort to North Middlesex in the final. Those types of performances led to Kevin being named to numerous all-star squads as well as being chosen team MVP. Other recognition included 1991 Midwatch League MVP, Clark Tournament First Team, First Team All-Central Mass, and the Massachusetts Top 40 All-Star and a starter on the Central Mass team. Kevin was also a member of the BABC AAU State Champions in 1988, 89, and 90 and competed in the AAU National Championships in 1989 where he was matched up against future NBA stars like Chris Webber, Grant Hill, and Jalen Rose. Let's call up Kevin Fair, class of 91. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a tremendous honor, and I'm extremely humbled. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the committee, the Hall of Fame Selection Committee, Nick. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank my family for their love and support during my playing days. Um, I was extremely lucky to have Jeff and Dolores Fair as parents. My parents never missed the game. Uh, it didn't matter if it was a Tuesday soccer game in the pouring rain in Lemonster, they were always there cheering and supporting me and my teammates. My parents sacrificed a tremendous amount for my athletic career. I played on countless club select teams, AAU teams, all-star teams, and they always made sure I made every practice and every game, no matter where in Massachusetts, New England, or even the United States the game was being played. One quick story that personifies their dedication and love 
uh, took place in my sophomore year uh, in Jonesboro, Arkansas, of all places. I was fortunate enough to make the state AAU basketball squad. Uh, not only did my parents drive me to seven different locations for seven different tryouts against you know a thousand players or so, but my father, after we flew as a team down to Arkansas, drove 18 straight hours from Milford to Jonesboro to make sure he was there for my first game in the tournament. What's funny about this story is as he was walking into the arena at Arkansas State University, we were playing the team from Indiana. I had uh, just picked the pocket of future NBA all-star Glenn Robinson, and I went in on a breakaway, and as my father walked in, Glenn Robinson completely bridged me and almost knocked me unconscious. <laughs> And as, I, as they were peeling me off the floor, I looked up to see my father, who looked like he'd been through hell and back, to drive 2,000 miles straight to make sure I, that he was there to support me. Uh, Mom and Dad, I love you guys very much, and I appreciate you more than you'd ever know. I also want to thank the outstanding coaches I was so lucky to play for at Milford High. Coach Charlie Stan, Coach Rob Pearl in soccer, and especially Coach Steve Manguso in basketball. We at MHS, we're at a huge advantage versus other teams in other towns. No one in our league or in our district or even in our state had the coaches the caliber that we did. Coach Manguso, you always brought out the best of me. I played hard, but you got me to play even harder. You taught me to lead and sacrifice personal goals for the benefit of the team. I played for a lot of coaches, but none at your level. I was so happy to hear when you were elected to the State College, State Coaches Hall of Fame. No one deserved it more. Thank you for everything you taught me. I still remember, um, like it's the back of my hand, if we're playing against man-to-man, -man, I know I could run Louisville right up here at this, at this dais. Um, I remember Indiana against you know, a 2-3 zone and PC against an odd man front. And who could ever remember, whoever could ever forget, black 23 on a make and five on a miss. <laughs> I've started my own coaching career with my kids, and many times during games and practices, I can hear you in my ear. I'd also like to thank the many tremendous teammates that I had at Milford. We had some great athletes in school. I was very fortunate to play with some great players. In soccer, guys like Steve Weber, Chris Basitis, Rui Lopes, Albano Correa, Alberto Panich, Josh Corpy, Pat O'Brien, Chuck Koch, Kevin Allegretza, to name a few. In basketball, guys like Jimmy Pine, Jerry Cahill, Jeff Grote, Ed White, Jeff Capitos, Louis Galindo, and Jose Colon. I know many times I was a challenging teammate. Right or wrong, I always expected everyone to play as hard and wanted as badly as I did. I approached every drill, practice, scrimmage, even pickup games, as if winning was the only thing that mattered. I know my expectations weren't realistic, but I love all you guys, and I greatly appreciate you guys putting up with my intensity. Lastly, and most importantly, I want to thank my children, Olivia, Brody, and Ava, and their mom, Kim. Now I am the captain of the most important team I'll ever play on, my family. I love you guys so much, and you guys push me so hard to want to be great for you. I also want to truly thank Kimberly Fair. After college and to this day, I continue to play in basketball leagues and tournaments, and my list of injuries suffered during that time is a mile long. Kim, who could not be here today, she's home with our special needs son. Um, she took care of me through all the torn ACLs, shoulder reconstructions, and, and blowing discs in my back. Uh, Kim, you're amazing, and I, I, I should have hung it up a long, long time ago, um, but you continue to, uh, to deal with my insane desire to compete. Finally, I'd like to congratulate all the other inductees. Uh, this is an awesome, awesome honor. It was, a, it was a tremendous honor to play for the Scarlet Hawks. Thank you all for coming. Next up, class of 2006, Danielle Peretti Fallon. Danielle Peretti Fallon, class of 2006.
When Danielle Peretti entered MHS as a freshman, she was looking to take up a sport that would allow her to use the individual gymnastics skills she developed since elementary school while giving her the experience of being part of a team. Diving on the swim team just happened to be the perfect solution. Despite her diminutive stature, it didn't take long for Danielle to make a big splash in the pool. By the middle of her freshman season, she'd broken the previous six-dive record, which stood for 12 years, by 20 points, posting a score of 208 just weeks after taking up the sport. She continued to raise the bar as a sophomore, breaking her own record three times, placing third in the Southern Conference, fifth in the MIAA sectionals, and tenth at States. Her new record of 233.40 was the highest score, male or female, in Milford Swim history. She was also the first MHS diver to place in the States since the late 1970s. As a junior, Danielle again posted a new record, 243.10, while shattering her 11-dive record, going from 343 all the way up to 456.1 points. She took first place in the Southern Conference, the MIAA sectionals, and was crowned MIAA Division II state champion. During her final season, Danielle was undefeated in dual meets, set a new six-dive record, and won the MIAA Division II state championship for the second consecutive year. She still holds both the six and 11-dive records at MHS. After the swim season was finished, Danielle competed at USA Gymnastics at Level 9 at the state and regional level. As a junior, she made it to the Eastern National Championships and went on to compete all four years at the Division I level at George Washington University, where she earned the Lindsay Ferris Attitude is Everything Award, presented to the gymnast who most exemplifies vibrant spirit for life, sincere passion for her sport, and selfless dedication to her team. Danielle, please come up and accept your award. Thank you. First off, I want to thank the selection committee. I'm completely humbled and honored to be part of such a... Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> I'm completely humbled and honored to be part of such a select group of individuals. And I've really enjoyed listening to the other athletes' stories so far. And it makes me really thankful to be here. It also feels amazing to be back in Milford. I don't live in the area anymore, so being able to look back at some of my most proudest moments and memories from Milford High School with absolutely a different perspective than I had when I was in high school is really special. Going into high school, I really didn't know much about diving, and in fact, my life revolved around competitive gymnastics. My parents encouraged me to try a high school sport to help me be a little bit more social, a little more involved in the community, and everything really just snowballed from there. We figured that gymnastics was a perfect fit because it was basically like, or diving was a perfect fit because it was like gymnastics, but you were landing in water instead of on a mat. Um, and it really just caught on quick. And I honestly owe it to my coaches, um, Dave Chaplin, who's here today, and Mike Guerra for making my experience what it was. You were with me every single step of the way. And I learned so, from, so much from you in the process. I'm thankful not only for your guidance and your support, but also for making my experience what it was. You nurtured such an excellent team environment among the swimmers and divers, which I think is really hard to do in what can otherwise be such an individual sport. And it was really special because with every accomplishment that I achieved, or vice versa, all of my teammates, we were together celebrating. And some of my most favorite memories, of course, were the big ones like you saw in the video. But just as much, I treasured the most perfect pep talk right before I stepped up to dive. Strategically planning my diving lists right before I stepped up. The big Long Island competitions the entire team looked forward to traveling to every year. Chatting between dives at practices. And of course, the number of towels and jackets we brought to every meet just so I didn't freeze. I also want to thank my family. They're taking up two full tables over there, and almost all of them, including my twin sister, Vanessa, who had her own high school commitments at the time, came to watch me dive in every single meet for its entirety. And I dove for a combined total at those meets for about 30 seconds. 
So just like today, I really appreciate that you're here and it meant the world to me. To my parents, from literally driving me around to all of the practices and the extra practices I had to do, to me telling you that I was learning dive number 105A with 2.4 degree of difficulty and expecting you to know what that was, <laughs> to you listening to me on my good days and my bad days, you were absolutely my biggest fans and I really appreciate everything that you did for me. What I want to thank you the most for though is the most important because with all of my accomplishments in diving, I told you one day that I wanted to leave diving in high school and do gymnastics in college instead. And even though it was an uphill battle and my gymnastics career not nearly as glamorous as my diving one, you guys supported me without hesitation and you never questioned me and you let me do what I wanted and what I loved. And I think that's so important because it's so easy to get caught up in successes and accomplishments with sports that you forget why you did the sport in the first place. And it was one of the best things that you could have done for me. So with that, I want to congratulate all of the other athletes in the room, not only for your amazing accomplishments to be here today, but also for having the privilege to do a sport that you loved. I also want to give a final shout out to Chappie, Mr. Guerra, and Milford Athletics for influencing such a massive part of my high school experience and some memories that I'll never forget. Congratulations to him, Danielle. Next up, Stephen Foley, class of 1985. Yeah. Stephen Foley, class of 1985. At five foot three and 107 pounds as a senior, Stephen Foley never let his size deter him from becoming a success in the athletic arena. In fact, he used it to his advantage while helping the teams he competed on achieve their own championship goals. Foley used superior quickness and agility as a forward on the soccer field to outmaneuver taller and slower defensemen. A tri-captain and one of only three seniors on the team, he was instrumental in leading the 1984 squad to the Midland League Championship. Steve was a determined competitor who hated to lose, something he didn't need to deal with very often during his four years as a varsity wrestler. He competed at 100 pounds in his first three seasons on the mat before moving up to 107 pounds as a senior. The numbers he compiled were phenomenal and his achievements are stunning. During a time when wrestlers were limited to 20 matches a year before tournament season, he amassed a four-year record of 126 wins, 11 losses, and one draw. Over his final two years, he won two sectional championships, two Division II state titles, a New England championship at 100 pounds as a junior, and was second at the New England meet at 107 pounds as a senior. He posted a perfect record of 44-0 as he swept through the dual meet and tournament seasons during his junior year. Steve was also a member of the 1983 Division II state championship wrestling team. A two-time Milford Daily News and Boston Herald All-Star, he was also a Boston Globe All-Scholastic in 1984. When he graduated in 1985, Steve held the Milford High School record for most career wins and career points scored. Steven, come on up. In case anybody didn't know what that was about, that was Nick's little... Uh, ceremony he did for me before every match to wake me up. A little harder than that. <laughs> a lot harder than that. Um, figured that would help with this speech also. Um, I want to thank the committee, the Hall of Fame committee, for my nomination today. Uh, I especially want to thank Coach Nick for everything he's done for me through my career. Uh, it's been a while since I've been back at Milford. I just moved back to the, the area this past year. Uh, I see some of my old teammates out here, Anthony Consigli. Robbie Lanzetta, Eddie Vaderegian, to name a few. Um, it's nice to see everybody again. Uh, it's, it's truly humbling to come back here uh, for an award like this in front of a lot of people that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, Charlie brought up some of the coaches that he, he served under. I've served under the same coaches. I think my class uh, back in 1985 was kind of spoiled with some of the coaches we had. Nick and uh, Charlie Stan, uh, Steve Manguso, um, 
Stephanie Slack, Linda Zakili, truly an all-star lineup of coaches, which made it a lot easier for us to uh, succeed as athletes um, back in the day. Um, I'd also like to thank my family, uh, my wife Gina, who's here with me today, my sister Lisa, uh, her husband Francisco, my sister Sherry couldn't make it today. They do have names uh, during high school. They were basically known as uh, Stephen Foley's sisters. So I just wanted to mention them. Uh, I also would like to thank my parents who are no longer with us. Uh, the sacrifices they made um, helped me uh, succeed in uh, sports and in life. And um, I want to congratulate everybody else here, all the nominees and thank everybody for coming. And thank Nick for not setting the bar so high for speeches for us wrestlers. So, uh, he did a good job. Thank you. Next up, class of 1951, Bob Gilmore. Robert H. Gilmore, class of 1951. Robert H. Bob Gilmore's 1951 Oak Lily and Ivy yearbook caption reads, Helpful, good-natured, a proven friend to all, one of the real gentlemen of the class. He was all that, plus an outstanding two-sport athlete whose only ambition was, quote, to be a success. At 6'4 and 210 pounds, Bob was a two-year starter at center, for Hall of Fame basketball coach J. Francis Cahill. During his senior year, he averaged 10 points and 12 rebounds a game while helping the team to a 12-7 and record. A highlight of his year was scoring 32 points in a victory over Midland League rival Marlboro. It was on the baseball diamond, though, that Bob really stood out. Teamed up with another Hall of Famer, Coach Charlie Bricado, he had a stellar three-year varsity career. Although a solid hitter who could hold his own as a right fielder, Bob developed into one of the best pitchers in central Massachusetts as a senior. A captain of the 1951 Scarlets, he compiled a 6-1 record, including two one-hitters. During one stretch, he went 40 and two-thirds innings without giving up an earned run and led the team to a 10-3 record. His efforts earned him a spot on both the Midland League All-Star team and the New England Hearst Sandlot baseball team. Bob also pitched for the 1949 and 1950 Powers Post Legion teams. The 1950 squad was runner-up to Somerville for the State Legion Baseball Championship. He played two years at the local semi-pro level before signing a minor league contract with the Boston or Milwaukee Braves in 1952. During his first season with Appleton, Wisconsin in the Class D League, he compiled a league-best record of 9-3, led the league with a 2.90 ERA, and 110 strikeouts in 93 innings. Despite suffering an arm injury that season, he went 13-5 with Lawton, Oklahoma the following year. A second arm injury ended his career in 1955. Always one to give back to the community, Bob served on the executive board of the Milford High Boosters Club for 28 years and as president in 1980 and 1981. Bob also contributed slew of great athletes to Milford High School and his children and two of whom I was privileged to coach as a wrestling coach. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm usually a man of very few words, but I would like to emphasize the fact that I had some great coaching in my day. Fida Cahill, Charlie Bracado, Pep Marcon, we had numerous uh, other uh, coaches. We had a great time. Uh, in my professional career, I was under uh, Stonewall Jackson, 1924 All-Star, the New York Giants, and uh, Hall of Famer. Uh, these people really helped me uh, to become what I was in baseball. Uh, although baseball did get me in trouble when I was a young man, uh, I had a paper route. It was extended up through Tank Field and all, a couple of other places, Peterson's Ball Field. 
and they used to call me the Midnight Paper Boy. <laughs> it was justified too. <laughs> we had a lot of good uh, times. The bad times when I hurt my arm, uh, I had to go into Boston Garden. At Boston Garden, Jock Semple, who also ran the marathon, uh, the, the meeting itself, uh, he gave me the whirlpool, uh, deep massage, and had a, a person coming over from uh, Hopedale to massage my arm three times a week. Uh, the first year I played ball, that's when I got hurt. After almost the All-Star game, I made the All-Star team, but I couldn't participate. Uh, it was a great time. I had a lot of good friends, and I want to thank the committee for having a mind to go back as far as 1951. <laughs> it's 67 years ago, uh, and it was, it was a great time. Uh, I want to thank my wife, who has been very uh, pathetic, watching me and listening to me watch baseball, football, basketball, and all the other sports. However, she couldn't be here tonight, although it is her birthday today. So afterwards, I think we'll go up and have a little cake. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> Millie was one of the great fans in the wrestling community, too. Uh, when her sons, Bob and Billy, would wrestle, Millie would go under the bleachers and just fret all day until they, the, whistle, the final whistle blew, and then she would come out. She came to every match. I don't think she ever saw one. Okay, next up, Rob Lanzetta, class of 1987. Robert Lanzetta, class of 1987. Robbie Lanzetta's work ethic, commitment to his team, and leadership qualities were an inspiration to his teammates throughout his athletic career at Milford High School. Though he never really experienced an off-season as a three-sport athlete in football, wrestling, and track and field, he always worked hard to improve his agility, strength, and stamina. Lanzetta, in the words of Hall of Fame coach Dennis Breen, always did the most difficult things well. Competing in the hurdles and discus and track, his quickness and strength oftentimes overcame the more technical skills of his opponents. On the wrestling mat, Robbie was a four-year starter and captained the team as a senior. He was a three-time sectional place winner and amassed a dual meet record of 18-6, and six, capturing the Division II Central Sectional Championship and a third-place finish at the Division II State Tournament as a senior in 1987. He was a key member of back-to-back -back sectional team championships in 1985 and 1986. Lanzetta was a two-way standout on the football field. On offense, he was a bruising fullback with speed, a tough combination for opponents to bring down. He averaged almost six yards per carry and scored nine touchdowns during his senior year. Defensively, he filled a key role as middle linebacker, helping to give direction to an inexperienced group. Aggressive but disciplined, he led the team in tackles and was near the top in interceptions. As a co-captain and team MVP, Robbie's leadership helped guide the 1986 team from an early season 2-2-1 two, two and one record to the Division I Central Super Bowl Championship. He also scored a record four touchdowns in the 38-6 win over Maynard. His exploits on the field earned him a scholarship to play football at Fordham. Robbie, come on up. Good afternoon, and thank you. That was a great video. Uh, CJ, I gotta say, you wore 45 probably better than I. Um, and, it's, and it's funny too, I gotta say, um, since that high school yearbook resurfaced, the photo of my high school yearbook, I've been getting more texts and emails about my haircut than about the effect of myself. Um, so again, I, I, I wanna thank the uh, Nick Sakili and the Hall of Fame Committee 
um, for this induction and, and for the countless and selfless hours they spend um, organizing and coordinating this event. It's, it's truly a tremendous honor for me to have been chosen to stand among all of the great athletes and individuals who have been inducted into this hall. Milford High School Athletics is undoubtedly one of the greatest traditions I've had the opportunity to be involved in in my life. And even more so, it's been such a pleasure being able to watch my son Zachary and my daughter Gianna compete in Milford High School sports as well. In fact, I, I want to say, uh, Mr. Boucher talked about the varsity cheerleaders being at the state championship tournament. My daughter couldn't be here today. I did just receive word that they're bringing home another state championship to Milford. So, Couldn't be more proud of the two of them. I also want to congratulate all the other inductees here today on their outstanding accomplishments. In the time I've had to reflect, I just want to take a little bit more time to thank all of the people who have been so very important to me in accomplishing this goal, as well as many of the accomplishments in my life. First and foremost, I want to thank my mother, Lucille, and my father, Dennis, for all of the love and support throughout my entire life and always encouraging me to be the best that I could be in whatever it was I chose to do. I want to especially thank all of my grandparents who were very instrumental in my upbringing as a young man and, and instilling in me the values of family. Two of them are here today. I'd like to acknowledge my grandfather, Alfred Lanzetta, and my grandmother, Marie Ficarelli. Both of them are two of the greatest role models from the greatest generation a guy could have ever asked for. Yay. I want to thank my brothers, Dennis and Scott, for all the beatings we gave each other throughout the years. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it was just what I needed to be prepared for the toughness and rigors required to play uh, sports like football and wrestling. Now to my extended family, those being the coaches who coached me during my time in high school. They were Dennis Breen, Nick Zakili, John Dagnes, Kevin Maines, Waxy Cullen, and Alan Green. These gentlemen not only coached me on the fundamentals of football and the techniques of wrestling, but they taught me some of the most valuable lessons of my life. Things like discipline, dedication, hard work, and leadership. They didn't just teach me in the sense that they would preach to me, but they always led by example. I'll say if the high school coaches of today want to be successful and be the best that they can be, they should study these men. They should ask a lot of questions about them and their programs. Not so much about the wins and losses or the X's and O's, but more about the relationships they built with their athletes. It was these relationships that were the foundation of building character and giving each and every team their own unique identity. These relationships have stood the test of time and last to this day, something I'm very proud to say. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank all of the teammates I've had the privilege of playing with. Most notably, the wrestling teams from 1984 to 1987, which included many New England state and sectional champions. Steve Foley being one of them uh, as a captain and tremendous role model on many of those teams. Some of the other guys, upperclassmen that mentored me in the sport of wrestling, were some of the bigger guys, the guys I had to practice with in day in and day out. Paul Tamani, Joe Cardi, Anthony Consigli, and Brian Brajoli. Of course, most special to me, I want to thank all of the guys on the 1986 Super Bowl championship team. It was an honor to play alongside each and every one of them. They were, without a doubt, the toughest Greatest bunch of bastards I've ever known. And I say that with all due respect. Um, some of those guys that are here with me today, my brother Scott Lanzetta, co-captain Ed Vaderijan, uh, master of the trap walk in his day, and Derek Atherton, best teammates ever and lifelong friends to this day. Coach Dagger told us back in high school, he said, the guys you share the locker room with now will become these kinds of friends. Guys you'll have 20 years from now, you'll sit down and have a beer with and reminisce about the most memorable times of your life. Well, in this case, it's 30 years, Coach, and you were absolutely right. 
Um, I could go on and on about the 1986 Super Bowl team, about the players, more on the coaches and the way the season unfolded, but hopefully we'll save that story for another day. I want to thank you all very much from the bottom of my heart. I feel truly blessed, and uh, this is certainly a distinct honor for me. Thank you. Our next inductee also from the class of 1987, Debbie Coke Mason. Deborah Coke Mason, class of 1987. Deborah Coke Mason entered Milford High in November 1984 as a sophomore transfer student who just played a significant role on an undefeated field hockey team at Central Bucks High School West in Pennsylvania. She didn't miss a beat and went on to become one of Milford High School's best three-sport athletes. Debbie made her presence felt immediately on the basketball court, working her way onto the varsity team and earning Rookie of the Year honors on a team that finished second in the Midland League and qualified for the district tournament for the first time in seven years. By her senior year, she developed into a versatile player at both guard and forward. Leading the team as a tri-captain, she possessed a smooth shot and was a tenacious defender. Coach Matt O'Connor attributed eight-seeded Milford's 53-52 upset of number one seed North Middlesex in the Division I Central quarterfinals to his decision to switch to man-to-man -to -man defense with Coke smothering the opponent's leading scorer in the second half. Debbie also earned rookie honors as a relief pitcher and outfielder in the 1985 Midland League champion softball team. She continued to excel as a starting pitcher and first baseman as the team qualified for the district tournament in each of her final two years. Koch's outstanding two-way play as a right link on the field hockey team during her tenure led Milford High to its best records ever. The 1985 team finished 11-1-4 and, and were Midland League champions, qualifying for the district tournament for the first time in program history. As a senior tri-captain and team MVP, she quarterbacked the team from her midfield position to a program best record of 13-2-3 and, and its highest finish ever in district tournament play. After beating North Middlesex 2-0, the team lost to Gardner in the Division I semifinal. Debbie's talent and fierce competitiveness earned her a field hockey scholarship to Division I Boston University, the first field hockey player from Milford ever to compete at that level. While she still excelled defensively, almost always marking her opponent's top scorer, Debbie developed into a solid offensive player as well. After helping the team to an NCAA Division I tournament berth as a junior, Debbie finished her career as captain of the 1990 squad. She continues to give back to the sport, coaching field hockey at both the youth and high school level in Pennsylvania. Debbie, please come up. Thank you. I'd like to thank Nick Zakili and the Hall of Fame Committee for this incredible honor. I'd also like to thank my family for being here to support me, encourage me, and for always being my number one cheerleader. To my fellow inductees, your achievements are so impressive and I'm honored to be in your company. I moved to Milford when I was 16 years old, a sophomore in high school. Um, it, was, it was a difficult transition, leaving everything that I knew in Pennsylvania, friends, family, a boyfriend, um, and a, a moving career in field hockey. Um, but I have to say, what lie ahead was just incredible. Uh, my, my honor, the honor to be here today and to be amongst all of you is just incredible. The Milford Athletic Community really took me in and grabbed hold of me. Um, they helped ease the transition, helping me to build lifelong friendships uh, with my teammates and shaping my athletic career. Coaches Matt O'Connor and Stephanie Slack were powerful influences on the athlete and coach that I would become. I don't know if you're all familiar with Matt O'Connor's coaching techniques, but he had a reputation of being tough. He was a yellow, a yeller, a foot stomper, and a teeth flincher. He was gritty, he had a big Irish temper, um, and he was intimidating. But as intimidating as he was on the court, 
he was an incredible person off the court, and he was sweet, a sweetheart, and he made you be the best person, best player on the court and off the court. Conversely, um, Coach Slack was just the opposite. She was always positive, she was a nurturer, and she was a listener. She was energetic on the sideline, jumping up and down, running up and down, and you could always hear her encouraging words on the field. Looking back to the teams that I played on, what struck me the most is that we didn't have like a superstar, phenomenal athlete who was basically dominating the field. We were all good athletic people. We were good players, we were gritty, we were taught to work hard and play harder. Often we were seen as the underdogs, not expected to make it past the regular season, but with heart, team dynamics, and the efforts of our coaches, we made the impossible happen. We beat teams who were projected to demolish us and moved into postseason play. What I've learned from my Scarlet Hawk memories, and I preach to my current field hockey players and to my own children, is that on any given day, any team will win. I cherish the memories that I have from my high school and college days, and I'm grateful that a move to Massachusetts, which in the eyes of a 16-year-old could have been devastating, turned out to be an incredible athletic and life journey. And one last uh, comment I'd like to say, even though I've returned to Pennsylvania, I want you all to know that my family and I are still number one New England Patriots. And that won't change, so. And Eagle territory, which is not a, a nice place to be. So, go Pats, and thank you very much for this honor. Next up, class of 1978, Jim Mazzucchelli. James J. Mazzucchelli, class of 1978. Jim Mazzucchelli built a well-deserved reputation as one of the toughest athletes, both physically and mentally, to have ever suited up for Milford High School. Not many individuals could match his tenacity and perseverance as a competitor. A three-year starter on the football team, Jim displayed his talents on both sides of the ball. As a fullback on offense, he was a devastating lead blocker from the I formation, clearing the way for the power running game. He was also counted on in short yardage situations to blast through the line for critical first downs. As a linebacker on defense, he usually wound up in the middle of every big defensive stop with a bone-jarring tackle. A captain during his senior year, he helped lead the 1977 squad to a 6-3 record. Jim was also a three-year starter on the wrestling team, where his physical toughness and methodical style served him well. He emerged as a force to be reckoned with with a sophomore year when he placed third in the sectionals, 157 pounds. He then followed that up with a 7-2 record as a junior after missing the first half of the season with a broken ankle. Maz became one of the most respected and consistent wrestlers in Massachusetts his senior year, wrestling at 170 pounds. He started to open eyes with a second-place finish at the prestigious Lowell Holiday Tournament. He then went on to compile an 11-1-1 record during the regular season, recording seven pins along the way. He completely owned the tournament season, winning the Division II sectional and state championships while leading Milford to its first team state championship. His mental toughness was on display in the state final when he battled with a 102-degree fever and still earned a 3-2 victory. Jim finished his career with the New England Championship, the first MHS wrestler to accomplish that feat. In order to achieve that, he had to beat the New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts Division I champions in consecutive matches. After putting together one of the most successful individual seasons ever for any MHS athlete, he was named to the Boston Globe All-Scholastic team. What up, Matt? Thank you everybody for coming. I'm not used to speaking in front of a lot of people. Um, someone told me once to picture everybody in their underwear off or naked. <laughs> I look at my coach neck. <laughs> Believe me, it doesn't help. <laughs> so if anybody tells you that, it's not gonna work. I'd like to thank the board, obviously. Uh, it's been a long time. Um, not as long as Mr. Gilmore. Uh, I didn't know you were such a great athlete, and thank you for, for being here. 
Uh, obviously, you have no relatives on the board either. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. The board is doing a great job. Um, it's great for the Milford youth. Uh, it, it gives them something to strive for and to look forward to and hopefully be in the same position we all are today. Uh, I want to thank, of course, the coaches who have gotten me here. Uh, there's been quite a few. I started uh, football at a young age. Uh, Pop Warner, seven, eight years old, had some great coaches. Um, but when I got to my seventh, eighth grade in, in my freshman year, I had a coach that actually taught me how to love the game and taught me a lot about football. Uh, and it's just so happy that he's here today. Uh, Bob Toki, uh, thank you so much for being my coach. Uh, his wife Stephanie, a great guy. And I wouldn't have done it without you, believe me. Uh, moving on to uh, my uh, football years in high school, I had a coach that um, actually changed a lot of lives, uh, uh, people's lives, uh, kids' lives. And uh, he's just a great coach, and it's just sorry he couldn't be with us today. Uh, he lost his life a few years ago, and that would be Dick Corbin. Um, one of the best coaches we ever had in the town of Milford. And yeah, I think he was good to go. I want to thank my family, of course. Um, my two brothers for making sure I didn't grow up, uh, Stephen and Paul, to make sure I didn't grow up to be uh, <laughs> a pansy, so to say. <laughs> they enjoyed helping my mother and father take care of me. Uh, my mother, Ann, and of course, Mary Zach was always at the rest of the matches. Uh, can always hear her yelling in our ears uh, every, every match. Uh, my father uh, always told me, nobody remembers who, can, who comes in second. And um, I've tried to uh, remember that you know, throughout my life, and, and it's worked so far. So I'm very grateful to my family, my beautiful wife, Rebecca, and my two sons, Dr. Mark Mazzucchelli and Nick Mazzucchelli. Thank you so much. Uh, for being a part of my life. Uh, uh, moving on to wrestling, I mean, um, I had a coach uh, that just taught us how to be tough. Just He put Milford Wrestling on the map, just like I said in the article. He, he was just a great guy and, and just taught us um, what we needed to be to be men and to be winners. And of course, that's uh, attorney Jim Woodoff and his wife, Barbara. Thank you so much. But then, of course, there's Nick. Uh, God, Nick, you're great, man. You took wrestling to the next level. Taught us how to be champions. You had a lot of fun doing it. Um, it it's a lot of fun, of course, when you're winning every match and just killing everybody. Um, Greg, you, you can attest to that. Uh, we just had so much fun because we, we, we won, and we were winners. And it was Coach Nick that did that, obviously, because they, they you're a Hall of Fame coach for wrestling in the state of Massachusetts. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know all of us need to watch the uh, Patriots game, so everybody else behind me, please hurry up. Um, seriously, it's, it's time to go. Um, I just want to say one thing in close. There's a lot of my teammates here from the 1978 State Wrestling Championship team. Uh, and I just want to say one thing. Wrestlers will come and go, wrestling teams will come and go, but 1978 team can always say one thing, and that is, we're the first. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you. Our next inductee from the class of 2000, Trevor Walker. Trevor Walker, class of 2000. As the curtain came down on the 20th century, Milford High School experienced unparalleled success on both the soccer pitch and the basketball court. It was no coincidence that Trevor Walker had a lot to do with that success. As a freshman, he made his initial appearance on varsity for both teams at tournament time. A three-year starter as a midfielder, Trevor played a key role in elevating the soccer program to one of the elite teams in all of Massachusetts. From 1997 to 1999, the Hawks captured three Midland Wachusett League A championships, two Division I Central Sectional Championships in 98 and 99, and was the Division I state runner-up to Marshfield High School in 1998. 
Walker was selected to the Midwatch League All-Star team in his junior and senior years and was also a Central Mass Division I All-Star in 1999. Trevor duplicated those accomplishments on the basketball court, once again helping lead the team to three Midwatch A championships, two trips to the Division I sectional finals, a Division I sectional championship, and an appearance in the Division I state finals in 1998. Walker earned the Midwatch A and Central Mass Division I All-Star nods as both a junior and a senior, as well as leading the Midland Wachusett League in scoring and three-pointers both years. A team captain and MVP his senior year, Trevor finished his MHS career with 1,039 points. Walker went on to star at Clark University, scoring over 1,500 points during a four-year career. Over that time, he was a four-year starter, a three-time New Mac All-Star, and was named an ECAC All-New England First Team as a junior. A team captain as a senior, Trevor still holds the Clark records for most games played and most games won as a player, as well as most career three-pointers. He's also one of the top 10 scorers in school history. Come on up, Trev. Thanks, guys, for all the grief so far. Tell me I'm going to screw the speech up. All those texts, they're great. Great start. Um, Just want to say... A lot of short Italians coming up here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm half Italian, I can say. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Nick, Coach Manguso, the entire Hall of Fame induction uh, committee. This is a great honor. Milford is an awesome place to grow up. I live all the way across the country now. The love of sports, the love of competing, the love of winning in this town is great. Uh, there's a lot of multi-sport athletes that have come up and talk today and I think that's missing in today's youth you know it's a uh, great playing multiple sports getting to know a bunch of good buddies that still give you grief and still give you shit today and uh, having beers with them has been terrific so thanks to the uh, induction ceremony um, Nick told me I had to talk I think three days before I flew out from California so I wrote this speech kind of on the plane um, so I might be forgetting a few people but I was thinking of funny stories and when I first met Nick, I saw photos of him in the trophy ser- uh, sorry, uh, the trophy case of Milford High. And he's like yoked out, beautiful head of hair, looked great. And I was like, this is an intense dude, he's with it. And I think Coach Dagestan somewhere. But before my sophomore year, we were playing St. Pete's in the districts. And he was trying to make me swim like a mile and a half in the last period of the, uh, the, uh, the day. I'm like, dude, I'm going to be gassed for this game. It's in two hours. No way am I swimming. So he drags me into Nick's office, and I expect Nick to get on me and, and make me do it. Very laid back, very chilled out. And I, I thought to myself, I'm like, how is this guy bald? You know, why is he stressed? <laughs> he had that beautiful head of hair. It's all gone now. So I don't know if Mike and Nick and Pete and those guys gave you so much grief that you just lost it all. But, uh, speaking of very relaxed, chilled out, laid back guys, Coach Manguso. <laughs> I think he's the original inventor of the Gronk spike, but it was the goose spike of a blazer every time we were down in the first five minutes of the game. That blazer, corduroy or tan, came off and was slammed on the ground, but made me love basketball. Um, Scott Hawks camp and the foot fires and, you know, every summer going and riding my bike from where I grew up down there just made me love the game. Um, so you're awesome. You did an amazing job rearing the younger kids, bringing them through the program. I hate that they call it Hawks and not Scarlet Hawks now, and uh, that should be brought back in. Mr. AD, I love the Scarlet Hawks comment. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to say thank you very much. Thanks to my team. I know there's a lot of crossovers, volleyball guys who both played soccer, vice versa. Um, we had great years in high school. I know that uh, the guy that wasn't always fired up as goose was Coach Pearl. And uh, I think we drove him pretty crazy. <laughs> so, Coach, yeah, it looks great, but it's still there, baby. <laughs> so, thanks to him. Um, I know the Pats already kicked off playing down in Mexico, so I'll wrap it up saying thank you to my family. Really appreciate you guys coming. Dad, you introduced me to soccer, coached us all growing up. Uh, love you all the world. And uh, Joe Marias as well, who's texting away, not listening. Yeah. <laughs> Am I going too long already, man? Go burn one outside. The, um, so I want to say that, thank you to uh, Coach 
Coach Brian as well. Mom, the original cheerleader and the woohoo lady. I don't know how many miles we put on Toyota Camrys driving all over New England for AAU and for premier soccer and for everything else. Lauren, Dan, Sean, Auntie, and uh, Auntie Jane, thanks for coming. So, thanks guys. Okay, next up will be the 1998 boys soccer team. Boys soccer team, Division I Central Sectional Champions, MIAA Division I State Finalist. Under the direction of Coach Rob Pearl, the 1998 boys soccer team had high aspirations for the upcoming season. After finishing the previous campaign with a record of 12-3-2 and and a second straight exit from tournament play in the district semifinals, Pearl felt the team had both the veteran talent and the drive to take home a championship. Co-captains Jeff Rogers and goalie Jason Sulo, who was named Midland Wachusett League MVP as a junior, led a talented group of returning seniors. Fullbacks Mike Zakili, Jack Loftus, and Sean Devendorf, midfielder Artie Papiris, and wings Steve Fraga and Anderson Carvalho. The team also featured returning junior starters Mike Cabral at left wing, Jeff Marias at right wing, center halfback Trevor Walker, and sweeper Matt Young. A deep and talented roster of underclassmen, including juniors Sean Parker, Dom Napoli, Mike Otland, Neil Callahan, Chris Lorenko, and Tim Pinto, and sophomores Andy Pertel and Brian Kelly helped propel the team to a 12-1-3 regular season record, handing two-time defending Midwatch League champion Wachusett its only loss of the season and securing the second seed in the Division I Central Tournament. During their tournament run, the Scarlet Hawks used an explosive offense and a stifling defense to capture the team's first Division I championship ever. A 5-1 win over Tantasqua, a 2-1 win over St. John's, and a 5-0 shutout of Worcester South earned the squad a date with Ludlow in the state semifinal. Mike Cabral's three-goal effort resulted in a 4-2 victory and propelled the team to the Division I state final against Marshfield High School. Despite a gallant effort, Milford dropped a 3-1 contest to the Rams, who finished with an unblemished record of 23-0. Mike Cabral scored 21 goals and 10 assists, and Jeff Marias added 12 goals and 10 assists to lead the team in scoring. Jason Sulo earned Central Mass Tournament MVP honors in goal, and the team completed the most successful soccer season in MHS history. Hey, we can have Coach Pearl and members of the team come on up. Coach Pearl, you can say a few words. Thank you. It's quite a group, I'll tell you. Before I get to that, though, what is it about this town? What is it about Milford when you come back? You always feel like you're home. Whether you move to the next town or you move to California, when you come back here, it's just something about this town. And ignore Trevor. He's offended more than just a short talent. So don't <laughs> But anyway, I can't thank Milford and the committee enough for selecting this team. Nick, all the hard work that you've done, and it's been great for me now as an athletic director, to rely on Nick. Nick has been a mentor for me and has helped me so much in my career over the past 12 years to do what I've done. When I left Milford, the first thing and the only thing I took with me from my office was the plaque from that year, the year of the state finalist championship for us. For us, we look at it that we won that game because we left it all on the field. Nothing stopped us. We played it out as hard as we possibly could. And you know, even now when I drive by BU heading into Boston, I look at Nickerson Field and I still think about that night. Could I have done something different that we could have won that game? Because we gave it our all, why didn't we win? But you know, as recently as Friday, or Saturday actually, my girls soccer team was in the state final and lost again. And their hearts were broken. And all I could think about was this team, how our hearts are broken. But you know what, we left it all on the field and there was nothing more anybody could ask of us. So for them, it's quite an honor. So to be recognized by this committee and be joined by all of the other members that are part of this Hall of Fame, it's just an amazing accomplishment. So gentlemen, I thank you. And I ask you, as you are now young men, that you look at your own families as they grow and think about what you can give back. Are you gonna be their coach? Are you gonna be their mentor? And are you gonna be a leader for your own children or the communities that you may live in? And hopefully you'll take that and you'll go with it because you're all a wonderful bunch of guys and I'm so happy to be back here today. There's only one thing I have to do though, 
I found out that Matt Young had beer in his backpack, so we're going out and run some laps when we've done that. So just so you know. Thank you again. Some things never change. <laughs> We're wrapping up the program tonight, and before we do, again, um, thank you all for being here, because I know as soon as the next one's over, everybody's going to be scooting out. So, uh, wrapping up the program tonight will be the 1999 uh, state champion, state runner-up volleyball team. 1999 Boys Volleyball Team, Central Sectional Champions, MIAA State Finalist. The 1999 Boys Volleyball Team, led by Coach Chris Rodolfi, managed to complete one of the most successful seasons in the program's impressive history and in the history of MHS Volleyball. Led by Captain Sean Devendorf, Michael Zakili, and Dean Yarsides, the team included seniors Jason Sulo, Jack Loftus, Sean Carrigan, Anderson Carvalho, and Yogi Patel, juniors Drew Gilman, Jason Phillips, and Felix Meister, and sophomore Rich McCarthy. Featuring an explosive offense and a stifling defense, the team completed a 21-0 match record and a perfect 42-0 game record during the regular season, highlighted by an early season victory that ended state powerhouse New Bedford's three-year win streak. Winning the Western Alliance League Championship and earning the top seed in the central section of the MIAA state tournament, Milford swept its first two opponents, Worcester South and Holliston, running its unbeaten streak to 23 matches and 48 games. Hosting an experienced Natick team in the sectional final, the team delivered the program's first central sectional title in a thrilling three-games-to-one match victory, producing a trip to the state semifinals. In the state semifinal, Milford was tested by West sectional champion Minichok, winning a hard-fought three games to two match and setting up a rematch with New Bedford in the state final. New Bedford came away with a straight-set win for the championship, handing Milford its only loss on the year. The team finished the 1999 season with a 25-1 match record and wins in 52 of 58 games played throughout the season. Sean Devendorf was named Western Alliance League MVP with four members of the team, Michael Zakili, Jack Loftus, Jason Sulo, and Dean Yarsides, named as league all-stars. Zakili, Yarsides, Devendorf, and Sulo were recognized as Milford Daily News and Metro West Daily News all-stars, and Yarsides and Devendorf were named to the Boston Globe All-Scholastic team. Okay, hold on one second, guys, before you come up. Uh... Selectman uh, Mike Walsh, former school committee chairman, would like to say just a couple of words. So I was sitting over there and I was making notes to myself and I took the paper and I threw it away and I said, I'm going to talk from my heart tonight. I heard a lot of people say tonight um, that have come back to Milford, um, why you come back to Milford? You come back to Milford because this is a unique community. I'm going to tell you that I was at the um, Veterans Day Parade, and um, we were at the Italian Vets, and a one-star general walked up to me, and he said, uh, can I have a couple words with you? And I said, sure. And he said, uh, I was driving here tonight in my car, I should say today in my car, and the wind was blowing, it was freezing cold, and I said to myself that there's going to be nobody at the parade. I said, well, General, you didn't have the experience that I had. I said, when I went by Tracy and Becky, outside Tracy and Becky, there were all these little children sitting in their chairs all bundled up, waving American flags. And I said, when I went by Restaurant 89, which is across from Spallone's, I saw the same thing. Little children sitting in chairs, all bundled up, waving flags. He said, when I got to Town Park and I saw the crowds that were on Town Park, he said, I was overwhelmed. He said, but then when you decided that you weren't going to have the ceremony at Town Park anymore, you were going to move it to the Italian vets, he said, I figured, who's going to go there now? Everybody's going to go home. The flags were blowing like crazy. It was freezing cold. The room was jammed. It was jammed. And he said to me, that's what makes this community a great community. That's what makes this a great community. And I said, General, I couldn't agree with you more. 
And um, the other day I was at the senior center for the Thanksgiving dinner for the seniors. First time I'd ever been there. Overwhelming. Overwhelming what we do for the seniors in this community. But I think what's more importantly is what we do for all people in this community. Last night, I was right here for the Special Olympics banquet. 360 people were here, jammed in this room, honoring all the athletes of Special Olympics. That's what makes this community a great community. And you have to understand, and I know you understand, it's, it's all of us. It's all of us. I look in this room right now and I see Marie Parenti, former state rep, 28 years. Brian Murray, our current rep. I see Steve Manguso, a legend at high school basketball. Even though you're coaching at Clinton now, I'm not very happy, but I'm gonna give you that one. Mr. Toki, and all of you. Um, that's what makes this community great, is that we all keep coming back and giving back to make this community a great place to live. And that's why we all keep, keep, keep coming back. So I want to just want to say thank you, Babe and Mary Oliva, legends, legends. Um, but thank you, thank you for all coming here tonight, and thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Okay, boys, come on up. And I guess uh, co-captain Sean Devendorf will say a few words. Thanks for having me. My name is Sean Devendorf. I'm just going to own it. <laughs> um, like Trevor had three days notice, I had about 30 minutes notice that I was going to speak tonight, so please bear with me on this. Uh, very proud to represent the 99 volleyball team. So I thank you to all the members of the team that are here tonight. And a special thank you to many of our parents who are here with us. They were there every game, all the parents in the room. How much time you put into all these efforts, uh, we are very supportive of it and very appreciative. So, really quickly, this really will be quickly. Our 99 team would run into the gym to the opening chords of Welcome to the Jungle. We would yell obnoxiously after every block. We had t-shirts made up that said, ask us who we beat and who's your daddy. So I don't think we are the most liked team in the state. I'm pretty confident about that. But I can say that we were tenacious and, and, and confident. And that was personified by our coach, Chris Rodolfi. Uh, Chris would say he didn't care what the other teams were gonna do if we played our game that we would win. And we did it for most of the season. It went 21 and 0 and uh, 42 0 in, uh, in that stretch with games. So we fell one game short, losing in the state final, but we enjoyed every minute of the season. We proudly represented Milford, adding to the success of the boys' volleyball program, and we remain a tight-knit group of friends, and the older we get, the better we were. I think everyone can, can feel that. So I'd like to thank our coach, Chris Rodolfi, I'd like to thank Nick Sakili, RAD at the time. I'd like to thank the MHS Hall of Fame Committee for honoring us tonight. It's a privilege to be inducted with such an accomplished class. And then lastly, I'd like to take a minute to recognize Linda Sakili. Linda is the matriarch of volleyball in Milford and the state of Massachusetts. And Linda, it's your leadership, dedication, and commitment that has helped this sport grow to new heights. Thank you, Linda. That's it, boys. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it was a wonderful night, and we'll see you again in two years.